Accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints. Just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We're continuing our run-through of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Right now we're up to the episode called Time's Orphan, the 24th episode of the sixth season. May 20th, 1998 is when it first aired. Teleplay goes to Bradley Thompson and David Weddle. Story credit goes to Joe Minoski, directed by Alan Croker. In this episode, an accident on the planet Golana sends Molly O'Brien through a time portal 300 years into the past into an uninhabited world. Beamed back too late, Molly returns to the present 18 years old, but with no immediate recollection of her life or her family. We're joined by Clay, who himself just fell into a time portal. How are you? It's called Time's Orphan? Orphan, like uh, like uh, Charles Dickens type story, Oliver Twist. I thought it was Time's Orb fan. <laughs> is that, is that, <laughs> I th- that's why I was expecting the whole thing to just be like everyone talking about how great the time orb is. Oh, Time's Orb fan is a yeah, pretty, pretty decent which is episode. Yeah, where my screen name comes from, <laughs> Time's Orb fan sixty nine. Clay, we're at the end of season six. Um, mm-hmm. The show, the show is on a skid for some reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, uh, I think they used up all their good ideas early, uh, early on in the season. I, I do have to say. Um, as far as time travel devices go, I will take mystical time orb over accidentally tripped and fell into a 2000 year old time portal that's been left on Yeah, uh, any day of the week. That's how I want to start this. So let's take a break. We're going to play an audio clip and then me and Clay are going to come back and break down time's orphan. Well, there's no doubt about it. The DNA sequences match. This is definitely Molly. My reading suggests that she's 18 years old. We pulled her out 10 years too late. It's a miracle you managed to get her back at all, Miles. Maybe if you tried again, you could pull her out when she was still a little girl. If you do that, there'll be no one to grow up and become this Molly. You'll be erasing her existence. Yes, but we'd have our Molly back. Miles, this is our Molly. Just because we missed the last 10 years of her life doesn't give us the right to take those 10 years away from her. First thought here, Clay... There's a very fine line, uh, as you were hinting at, between acceptable sci-fi setup and not acceptable sci-fi setup for some mm-hmm. reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. There's something like I, I don't think it's hugely problematic or anything, but it like it really takes me out of the episode. The setup to this one, it, it just seems yeah. it seems like a mid '90s after-school special. Just the scene of her hanging off the cliff, and O'Brien's like Molly, and then she falls mm-hmm. into this glowing, uh, horrible CGI time portal thing. Mm-hmm, it, it's mm-hmm. yeah, it's um. The episode feels like a early season DS9 episode, and apparently the script idea had been kicking around for years, and they just never wanted to use it or never found a good time. And I guess during the the downslide of the end of season six, they were just looking for ideas, and they took this Minoski idea, which was originally planned and pitched as a way to kill off Alexander, was the original idea here, because Minoski huh. apparently hates the Alexander character. That's uh, interesting. And so they didn't do that. They decided that Worf and Alexander on a picnic was a little bit ridiculous, so they stuck the O'Briens into it because we haven't seen them in a while. But um, what would you think of it? Where do you want to go from here? Um, directly on to the next episode. Mm. We've been seeing that for the past couple episodes, though, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not obviously not as uh, <clears throat> objectionable as the previous one was for various reasons. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's... Uh, it 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 did pretty much nothing for me. It it doesn't surprise me that this is something that has been kicking around for a while. Um, that's yeah. The setup was ridiculous. Uh, I just couldn't stop laughing at the fact that the the planet hadn't been inhabited in two thousand years, and someone just left the time machine on. Yeah, they like left it. They're running the off the power pod. bill. <laughs> yeah. Um and then and then all of a sudden after she falls through it's like up oh, the signal's broke up we we accidentally clicked the off button and we can't get it to start. Yeah, I don't know. It was just a little yeah. silly. Um I I <laughs> it is funny to hear that it was uh originally a Worf and Alexander show though cuz um first of all that's hilarious cuz they just essentially literally wanted to throw Alexander into the trash. Yeah. Um and secondly, it it brings up my favorite line in the in the episode, 
where uh, Worf is um, stating his case to Dax that he is uh, capable of raising a child. And he's like, well, I I wrote, raised Alexander, didn't I? And I immediately wrote down, that is not a good answer. <laughs> Episode kind of touches on that. Uh, strangely enough, I, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of weird stuff like that. Like the, the, uh, the immediate, I mean, I get it, you know, from the parents angle, but the immediate, uh, response of miles to be like, well, well, fuck, fuck this girl, throw her back in and let's erase her from time and get the original one back. Obviously. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's a little bit it, it's a little bit of a confused episode. I would say that this one is um it's one of those like I could almost see making an argument that this is a worse episode worse episode than Prophet and Lace was the the last one where Yeah. Th- I I I know where you're going with that and I kind of agree with you I think. Like this one feels to me one of those Star Trek episodes that has no central concept to it. Yeah. It's like they they mm-hmm. don't have an idea about what this is supposed to be. At least Prophet and Lace Felt like a horrible attempt at some sort of sexual gender politic thing that they sure. were going for, and it's it's bad, and they missed the mark. But you spend your forty five minutes watching this one, going like, are they ever going to have like a point to this? Like, wh- what is yeah. the O'Briens? What is wrong with the O'Briens in this situation? Like, how do they feel about this? Why am I supposed to care because it's Molly? And the only real redeeming factor to this episode, I think is that I do like the Worf and Dax subplot. I think it's mm-hmm. almost like too good for this episode, and it's almost a perfect little B-plot for Star Trek shows to have, uh, something like mm-hmm. that, especially DS9. It's got good comedy. I particularly like the thing where uh, the baby's crying in the middle of the night, and he's like, I fed him. I read him a story. And then Worf has to like psych himself <laughs> up for battle before going back into the room. Uh, I like that stuff. And I Did like you the- identify that with that as a father? Uh, our kids don't didn't cry. I do. I do identify our kids never had that kind of a thing where they wouldn't go back to bed. But I do identify the kind of like the uh, the tiredness of people getting out of bed in the middle of the night is something mm. that I related to very strongly. But the the B story works for me here, yeah. and the B story works for all the reasons that the A story doesn't. Because the B story is built around characters that I care about and I understand what their conflict is that they're going mm-hmm. through. The O'Briens continue to just be an empty shell of a family that only exists because they need to give O'Brien some kind of backdrop. And they're they're not real characters. I continue to be blown away by how bad of a portrayal of a father and a husband Col- uh, Colmini gives in this performance. <laughs> it's it's just awful. Like, there's nothing to the O'Briens that makes me want to watch them do anything. Yeah. Um, he's kind of... <laughs> He's like Jeremy Renner from Hurt Locker if he was in Starfleet. <laughs> Coming up on Real Ripe and Real Rotten very soon. Yeah, his 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 wife and his wife and daughter, he sees them for the first time in like six months and he's happy about it for like a night and then he's like, Fucking Jesus. Get off my back. <laughs> Send them back. Um I do have to say I was very, very happy that this the B plot was about Worf and Dax and, you know, was enjoyable instead of uh following down the road of the head fake that they gave me that it was going to be fucking Odo and Kira mm. uh, talking know, about babies. Odo be- yeah. Odo being like, you realize that I can never give you the child that you want and then <laughs> crying about it for like 40 minutes. Uh, I'm really happy they didn't do that. Um, I continue to hate that relationship with a passion. Uh, they reined it in a little bit here. They do have that one. I awkward just don't conversation. like it. Yeah. I don't know. I just, it's not, it doesn't feel right. It's not, uh, yeah, I don't know. But you know what's good? Odo deserves to be alone. You know what's good about the... I, I do want to talk about Odo because I... Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do Odo after this. The, I like that scene with Kira and Odo because to me, it highlights what maybe people think is like, I'm going on too much about this, about the O'Briens. Kira's mm-hmm. interaction with Kiro, Kira Yoshi is more believable as a parent than the interaction of the O'Briens to each other. There's like, Oh, yeah. Yeah, big There's time. just no relationship to the O'Briens. They feel like they're actors acting on a bad TV show that they are supposed to be a family. And, you know, you could you could argue that this is almost like a much lesser version of The Visitor on some level. But I think that The mm-hmm. Visitor is helpful for explaining why stories like this work and what you need for that kind of a story to work. And yeah, yeah. Time's Orphan, the Molly storyline, doesn't have anything. It doesn't have Molly's perspective. Molly is not a character in this. She's just a right, thing right. that happens. And the ending, I find 
sort of appalling that she phases out of existence because to me that kills any kind of consequence that you're supposed to draw from this. Like the O'Briens don't know that she phased out of existence. They think that they've sent her back to this lifetime. But if the O'Briens think that, why does the show phase her out at all? Have that actually be the case where it's like, you don't know what happened to this version of Molly. She's just off doing her own thing. It's kind of a tragedy. I don't think it saves the episode, but at least it adds a little bit of something to it. Well, they kind of, I think they kind of assume that she doesn't exist anymore because, because they give that breakdown about, oh, well, yeah, the, the reconfiguring blah, 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 sent her back to the point where Molly went back the first time. Uh, so I think they, I assume they put the pieces together that, you know, uh, she probably doesn't exist anymore. But is it, is it even sad if she doesn't? No, Miles didn't give a shit. No, but I, I don't think I give a shit. Like, I, if that, yeah. if Molly still exists, it's kind of the problem I had with Children of Time, which is like I don't really count that person as a real person. Almost. Well, it's also, it's kind of different in that you are by phasing that character out of existence, you are objectively giving her a better life. It's not like it, in children of time. At least there was 300 years of, of uh, civilization and people were happy and blah, right. Blah. They had built and this one. It's yeah. And this one, you've got a feral child who's been scraping by to survive in the wilderness for 18 years. Mentally or, damaged at this point. It yeah, seems yeah. mentally damaged, freaking out anytime she sees walls, essentially. Um, and you are, taking her out of existence in favor for getting having that character get a second chance and yep. having her live the life that she was supposed to live with her family. Yeah. Who gives a shit? Of course. Yeah. I, I think that's a fundamental problem and with the episode that, that also that the solution seems too optimal. Yeah. Also, I mean, you lose any sort of pathos for this character by the fact that she doesn't talk. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't make her case about why her existing matters. Right. She's just sort of like, you know, barking at people and it's 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 uh it's yeah it's it's not it's not particularly moving i mean i guess it's it's kind of nice that she no it's not even nice in that way because she has no concept of what she's doing at the end i mean she's she she doesn't yeah yeah no sorry she can she can uh it's nice that she recognizes the solution to the problem for the little girl version of molly but it's not like she realizes she's actively sacrificing herself or anything it was <laughs> when she puts her in through the through the thing as she starts to dissolve she should have started freaking out being like what's going on <laughs> right come back come back this is not what i wanted <clears throat> the original uh, first draft i guess had her not going back in time to an uninhabited planet but she found like a village and was raised by sure. different people that yeah. to me is a better idea than this oh, 100 percent. because yeah. that point if she comes back and is a character you can see why she would be angry at the O'Briens and why there's a kind of tragedy to what happened there, which is that she grew apart from them. It, it mm-hmm. seems to me that it, it seems like they're trying to make that this is some kind of case for taking care of a special needs child. However, I think it's better if it's more about uh, being disgruntled with your family because of a choice that they may or may not have made, even if it's fair or unfair. Yeah. I, I would rather have a little conflict between them as opposed to the, O'Briens are having a hard time raising a child who needs like special care. And they also make it seem like the utopian 24th century care of this kind of child is like sending them off to the gulag for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. If that's the, I didn't even think about that as being what this was quote unquote supposed to be about. Uh, But if that is the case, then this is a a hundred times worse than than profit and lace. Okay. Why why is that? (laughs) You want to flesh that out? Because, because the uh, um, the argument there is, well, we can't deal with it. We may as well just let it into the wild. And then right. when the when the uh, when the quote unquote normal version comes back, it's like, oh, oh, well, this worked out great for everybody. You know, it's that's <laughs> it's it's very. If that's the case, they were trying to make that's very uh, very insulting and dismissive of people with uh, uh, mental handicaps. When, when little Molly comes back. Uh, O'Brien's just like, did anyone hear that blood curdling scream in the distance there? Oh, what was yeah. that? That was yeah. a strange. Yeah, thing. but also, yeah, like the the uh, the the Starfleet answer is, yeah, we'll br- we'll throw her in a mental institution. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. It just doesn't feel right. It feels like 
But I don't even know if they're saying that. Like they, I imagine it's a very nice facility that she's going to. Like I, I, I just can't imagine. Maybe she'll get Spock's cell. I don't know. Right. It seems it seems difficult to talk to those section. Talk to those people who weren't actually killed in that video that nobody bothered to talk to when they were trying to frame Spock for murder. Still hung up. Still hung up on these things. Hey, big problem. (laughs) It's it seems to me that. I don't even know if that if the episode is about taking care of a special uh, needs child because I wanted to view it so badly as more of she is angry at her parents and her parents have to. I viewed it more of a uh, child growing up metaphor where you have to let go of your kid at some point. Mm. And I feel like it stresses that, but it all comes back to this point of I feel like all these plot threads are circling around no central concept. So you don't know yeah. – what yeah. you're supposed to feel or if this is about special needs, if this is about growing up, if this is about difficulties with your parents. And it all just comes down to uh, Kalmini and Rosalind Chow sort of staring, mouths gaping at this like woman who's pretending to be a gorilla, basically running around <laughs> on a holodeck jungle. And it's like, well, yeah. this is not this is not really doing anything for me. Yeah, uh, I was. I think that was the biggest miss in this episode was I did not think that the acting was up to snuff to handle this. The girl who played older Molly was fine. Like, you know, whatever, but that's the best she can do with this. Like there's there's not a lot that you can really expect out of someone to do that. But O'Brien and Keiko, like they're, I don't, they, I don't think they, they just did way. They weren't bringing the heat. for This (laughs) This is, you know, when you send your, when you send your uh, daughter who you've, who you thought was lost to the sands of time, back into the time portal because it's the right thing to do to let her live her life. And, you know, you know that she's going to be gone forever and you're just kind of like stand there while it happens. Yeah. Um, and not really re- react. I mean, she, she gives a little bit of like a theater cry towards the end, but I don't know. I wasn't buying it. It was just, was not. No, it was, it felt like Harry, there was more, there's more, there was more emotion at the end of Harry and the Hendersons. <laughs> <laughs> do, you ever, do you remember that? That's yeah, like do, the, yeah. one of the most heartbreaking ends of a movie I've ever seen as a child. Yeah, yeah. The uh, yeah, I, I think you built on everything we know about O'Brien at this point. You do get the sense of like he'd rather just get rid of Molly than have to deal with her at this yeah, point. I'm, like, I'm sure in the back of his head when she was going into the portal, he's like one down. <laughs> Yoshi, you're up next. I've on him. You know, Keiko. She probably needs a mom in this new society she lives in. <laughs> I have a uh, – I, I feel that they – the O'Briens are just really poorly done in all situations. Yeah. And, and a lot of it, it, de- it depends that uh, Rosalind Chow Keiko is not a main cast member, so she is not as involved as uh, O'Brien is in this. However, mm-hmm. I found it absurd that after they rescue their daughter who's gone through this trauma, Keiko seems to find every reason to just leave. For what, like she's like, I gotta yes. go to work. Yeah, I gotta go shopping. I gotta do all this stuff. She, I, I, very consistent with her character. She's always finding a reason to to leave. run off. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think both of them. I think both of them aren't really engaged in this relationship anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, I feel like they're staying together for the kids, and now one of them was gone, <laughs> so and, and O'Brien home. was like halfway there to be in home free. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 certainly not good. Um, and we'll it, it, send her back to the past. We'll get Dax to adopt Yoshi. We'll get a divorce. And uh, I'll live with, uh, you know, I'll live the bachelor life with Bashir. Yeah. No, I could, I and could you easily. can go do whatever you like to do because I don't know what you like because we don't spend any time together. I just think the Times Orphan A story with Molly is just like a – just a bad failure at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just – Feels very much like a season one idea, down to the setup of falling into a time portal. Feels like a very yeah. early sci-fi concept that they wanted to do. The effects were bad. The effects were bad. You don't get anything from Molly coming back. The O'Briens continue to be atrocious as a family. So I, I guess we can just focus on um, the Worf and Dex thing, which I do like, which I think is very good, which I think uh, is nice to see them as a couple. It's nice to give a storyline to Worf uh, that makes sense within context of his character. And I mm-hmm. think that they were delightful actors with the baby. I think that ev- everyone seemed to be having a fun time with the baby. And that that uh, plot line just contrasted so sharply with the misery that everyone seemed to experience in the Molly storyline. It was very strange. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, they seem to be having a good time. Uh, I always, I always enjoy the uh, the lighter side of Klingon culture when uh, when when Worf has to do something that is uh, very um, friendly to, to 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 people that you don't wouldn't think you wouldn't expect him to be friendly to. Yeah, he's got to he put up so, with their, their their shit. Yeah, yeah, but he does it so seriously where he's like where even. Even even playing with a child is like a, is serious business and yeah. it has its own word. When, and, you he, know. when the baby bumps his head, Worf goes, I have failed him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's good stuff. Yeah. And his, uh, I was surprised, uh, Dax didn't, didn't go off on him a little bit more at the end. Um, because if I know if it were me and my spouse were projecting onto me that i was judging them and their fitness as 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 a partner or someone who could raise a child and they just kept saying that to me i'd be i would probably lose my mind mm. cuz it's like no just watch the baby i don't care it has nothing to do with whether or not i think you're a good dad yeah. or a good mom just watch the child and leave me the fuck alone not not a test what would you think of would you think of bringing wharf uh, feeling he's a failure because of things like Alexander and stuff like that into it. He he mentions at a point when Kiryoshi bumps his head, he's like, I failed him. I failed Alexander. I'm just a bad mm-hmm. father. I was, I was unsure whether I wanted to get that serious with it because mm. I was kind of liking the lighthearted, just like Worf and Dax talking about it. It's almost like I subconsciously just want to forget that Alexander really even exists at this point. Yeah. But yeah. it did feel appropriate to bring it up at that point. I just don't know if it's like short shrift to be in the B story. That's nine minutes of this plot overall, or what would you think about it? Yeah, I think you could go either way with it. Cause uh, I, I thought it was a, I liked it because I think it would have been weird for, for them to do this child storyline and completely ignore the fact that Worf already has a son. And it would feel a lot like, you know, uh, my uh, wharf second family is the only family that matters, right. which is, you know, tough. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I think if you really wanted to deal with that and what that means to wharf and you really want to get into the mindset of like, he feels like he failed his son. I think that probably deserves a little bit more time. Um, so I think the only, the only compromise is to, is what they did here and, and kind of do it, kind of play it for a joke a little bit, but also kind of be a little bit serious with it. And, uh, Acknowledge that Alexander exists and uh, um, just sort of move on. And, and acknowledge that Worf never raised a baby. He only – he got Alexander when he was four, True. I think they True. say. And yeah. so it's, which is a good sort of um, – you know, it's a nice little setup for conflict there where Worf is totally unexperienced with the babies and not sure what to do with them. Um, yeah, I, I think that they – I think it's good. I, th- I think it just – it's a good DS9 story. And apparently it was a late edition. It didn't actually exist in the first draft. They just came in very short on the Molly storyline because there's mm-hmm. nothing to talk about there. Yeah. Uh, so they added it in. And to me, it just it feels like that's what the series does well. It takes those. You've got some characters that you know. It's got this backstory that they want to build off of. You can introduce a little bit of like lighthearted comedy. It's actually, for all the failures of Prophet and Lace as a kind of comedy, this is the kind of Star Trek comedy that I think works, which is mm-hmm. – subtle character you know Worf is like i'm a warrior i can beat this baby kind of stuff it's not it's not slap you know knee slapping like oh my god guffawing like crazy kind of comedy Mm -hmm. it just works Mm -hmm. better here and it's it feels more like this is what the show should be when it tries to do things like that yeah yeah you know i was thinking um i thought they were going to have a little bit more balls with it uh and keep her as an adult because I thought that would have been the interesting move to do. Mm-hmm. It would be to just that's just the way it is now. Is she is she's older now? Because as I was watching it, I was thinking like, is this a way to write Molly out of the show, or is this a way to avoid having to work with a child? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, it doesn't even matter because it's not like she's on the show every week. It's not like a huge. I doubt having that kid on two episodes a season is like a is a massive uh, undertaking. Or yes, anything. right. Are you talking about um, but, old or young Molly at that point? Two two episodes a season. Oh, I was uh, when I was thinking that what they were doing was replacing young Molly with old Molly permanently. My thought was, oh, is it a way to to not have to deal with the kid, 
but then I was in like writing stuff for the kid oh, see, or having yeah. the, or having the actor come in and whatnot. But it's like she's only in two episodes a season anyway, so writing if for that, a kid. She, she might yeah. be in. If she might that, be in yeah. six episodes of the series so far. Yeah. I think. Uh, and and she's not. And that that sort of big change feels like something they would do um, with a more central character. Yeah. Um, but then, and I, and I was thinking, I in, uh, I was thinking of it like sort of like Zial, where it was, she would that it would be a new element brought in that was kind of touched on. But you know, and I was think I was obviously thinking extrapolating it out much further than the episode did. Yeah. Well, um. Then I was thinking the the fun thing to do would have been if she wasn't, f- you know, I think if she comes back and she's feral, then every time you touch back on it, it's basically the same story where it's like, oh, she's. She's relearned how to use a fork today, Miles. It's like, oh, isn't that great? I'm glad we spent the time doing this in the right. show. But um, I was thinking it would be kind of fun if she came back fully formed, like she, like you were saying, like she had been part of some sort of civilization and actually had some like a hardened edge to her or something. Mm-hmm. Because injecting a, uh, a character like that that's uh, from a less advanced civilization – into Starfleet and into the family of Miles and Keiko, who are kind of silly people, uh, <laughs> would be kind of fun. Right. Like um, when uh, a, f- a handful of years ago, um, they introduced a new Robin in the Batman comics. Uh, Batman, Bruce Wayne was presumed dead. So Dick Grayson, the first Robin, took over as Batman. And he has a much more, he's always had a much lighter uh, approach than Bruce Wayne. That was always kind of the, the trade off is Bruce Wayne is serious and dark. Dick Grayson is a little bit more lighthearted, so it's a nice balance. And so when Dick Grayson became Batman, they introduced, or shortly before that, they introduced this new character called Damian Wayne, who was uh, Bruce's uh, uh, son. Evil stepson or something. Yeah, no, but... it was his son that he didn't know that he had with Talia al Ghul, who was the daughter of Ra's al Ghul, who was the leader of the uh, uh, League of Assassins, mm-hmm. made famous by the Chris Nolan movies. So the 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 thing was he's like eight or like twelve, but he's been trained as an assassin his entire life. Right. So he's like super serious and really like uh, intense and violent. So they paired those two up and basically flipped the Batman and Robin dynamic. So now Batman is a lot more lighthearted and Robin is really hard and, and dark. And it was it was a really cool uh, a really cool tone shift. And I kind of had that in my head when I was watching this, going like, oh. This- that's too bad they didn't do that. That could have been a lot of fun for the one other episode they probably would have done it in. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if this is a reset button episode. I guess you could kind of consider it to no, be. No, I don't think it is. You I don't, don't think, think it is. I, I would. Are they, do they even show up again in the rest of the series? I I wouldn't be surprised if the answer was no. Uh, who doesn't? Sorry, Keiko and and the kids. Oh no, I don't. I don't think so. But I I, I think that goes into the the problem of it. Like if you if you were going to kill off molly in this episode Mm -hmm. i think that's a ballsy way to go about and i think it's maybe a good idea i don't think it improves the episode because i don't think that molly is enough of a character where this kind of like pseudo melodrama would really land for any reason Mm -hmm. however just fixing it at the end it feels like it's that old style Star Trek thing where yeah. it, it doesn't feel very DS nine y where none of this is going to carry over. I like your comparison to Zayal, where her she even just came in for a couple of episodes, but she had an impact on the characters yeah. who were yeah. there. Molly's never gonna have that impact. So it just feels like it's this like, well, blip in time thing, it's over, everything's yeah. back to normal, and we're curiously mm-hmm. not interested in the life of phased out Molly at this point. It's like who cares about yeah. her? Mm-hmm. All right, yeah. let, let's uh, take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. Me and Clay will come back. We're going to give some uh, our thoughts and then patron thoughts. All right. By the way, what does gung, gung, gung mean? Why do you ask? Well, it was the, the strangest thing. I was taking Yoshi home, and he kept shaking his rattle, saying, gung, gung, gung. He did. He seemed to get a big kick out of it. So what does it mean? That is between Yoshi and me. So if you guys want to support the show, the best way to do that is patreon.com slash the Penske file. You have a couple dollars a month and you get extra stuff, extra podcasts, behind the scenes, Q&As, all that good stuff. Patreon.com slash the Penske file. 
And as always, our Captain Tier supporters get a shout out. Special thanks go to Andrew Sherlock, Ben Douglas, Captain Quark, Cardinal Doomsday, Christian Pouch, David Kay, Dwayne Hackett, Eric Johnson, Yarpy, Joint Mango, Kevin Reyes, Kyle Barrett, Matt Cutler, Matt Ross, Mike Burnett, Nathan Elliott, Neil Brennan, Nick Sergi, Robert Cummins, Russell Elledge, Samuel Custer, Grim Santos, Sean, Spinobi, Tark Latif, Vault 13 Hero, and Will Yates. Thank you very much for supporting the show, guys. Now we go to patron thoughts, Clay. If you mm. support the show on Patreon, you get to leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes, and we read them on the podcast. Samuel S. says, Time's Orphan. I was half expecting O'Brien to knock out Odo with a single punch again outside the airlock. Other than that, I was bored out of my mind. A one out of five. This brings up a point I wanted to say, Clay, that I forgot. And this is why I like the patron comments, because they remind me of things. Mm. Um, what is Odo good in this episode? Is this good, like, writing for Odo? I here, Here's why I say that. I really liked the... Uh, he has two scenes, basically. He has the first scene where he tells Cisco about the stabbing that Molly has done. And they have a, a scene where O'Brien, Cisco, and Odo talk about what's going to happen to Molly. Mm-hmm. Odo in that is doing his job, but I also get the sense of he is grown from the character who in the first or second season would have said, like, lock her up and maybe execute her, like, depending on what's going on. <laughs> He's grown into more of a sympathetic character who sympathizes and empathizes with the other cast members and the difficulties Mm -hmm. that they're going through. And I think that shows his growth. The other scene he has is when they find the O'Briens trying to steal the shuttle, he lets them go, which to me does not feel like Odo at that point. And so I'm conflicted about whether or not this is an appropriate way to write Odo or why that scene exists. What did you think? Eh, Yeah, I don't know. I mean, what's the alternative that they get into a fight that they just escape? I think. Yeah. I don't yeah, know why think, Odo's there at all. Yeah, I think they just need it to to seem like it, to put a, another bit of uh you know, tension in an otherwise tensionless episode. Okay. Just the 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 bit that oh, they run into an impediment and then they have to find their way through. You know, I think I think it's playing on it's playing on Odo being the hard ass uh security guy. And so when you get caught by the hard ass security guy and then you know, ultimately he lets you go. It's like, oh, you know, that's, it's not what you're expecting to happen. So also um, the, uh, Starfleet security, the first lesson they all need to be taught is never turn around to see what someone is showing you <laughs> yeah. because every time that happens, you always get a hypo spray in the neck and you go down like mm-hmm. a sack of potatoes. Yeah, don't let anybody stay like step behind you to point something out like <laughs> down at the computer panel. Cause you're getting a needle in the neck, pal. I so I, I was, like, it's funny because when he when he made that movement towards him, I I made like the karate chop motion because I assumed that's what he was going to do, and right. I guess you, that shows how they've changed since the original series. Because <laughs> in the original series, he would have gotten a karate chop to the neck big time, or the uh, that's a Vulcan neck bench. Yep. Uh, judo chop. If I ever saw one, judo yeah. chop from Austin Powers. Yeah, I um, it, it just made me think about Odo, and I don't know if it's a intentional thing that they're trying to do, but I do like the general growth that Odo has gone through to this point. I just didn't like him saying like, "Yeah, go ahead, you crazy kids, get out of here, go back to well, that." Well, I mean, portal. at the same time, like, why is what they're doing like illegal? Right. So why do they have to Who steal the shuttle? Shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, she stabbed the dude. I guess that she is technically in in uh, arrested. That's but- true. I guess that's the reason. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, like, in the grand scheme of things, I, that's why when Odo showed up, I was like, well, I mean, I assume he's going to let him go, because I, I think even he would recognize that the, the alternative is not what's best for this child. Yeah, but I, I think that's a new evolution of Odo, to recognize that, because uh, that's breaking the rules, and Ro- Odo is the rule follower, you know what I mean? He's right, the right. He's the one who lives for rules. Norman Buckwald says... Okay, for all the praises that DS9 Season 6 deservedly gets, there are a few definite stinkers in this season. While nowhere near as bad as Profit and Lace, this story, which obviously had a reset button, seemed to be the creators trying to figure out the O'Brien episode, which I, for once I guess he's not suffering directly as usual except as a parent. I'm surprised yeah, if anything, if anything, he's kind of happy for a second. Yeah, he's <laughs> his family. His fa- <laughs> as his family this falls apart, he stands proudly. Yeah. Yeah, it should have been, it should have ended with him waking up from a dream and been like, "Damn it!" <laughs> I'm surprised Odo still didn't have to deal with charges against a now young Molly, as I could see some alien species of DS9 going to that degree. Considering the circumstances, it can be seen as amazing that Molly was still alive. I would have expected her to be raised by some kind of new species, which actually would have made this episode much more interesting. Otherwise, filler space. Uh, isn't there a war going on? 
Uh, what if what if this episode had taken like a really dark turn and the second half of it had been a uh ethical courtroom drama about whether or not you should try a mentally handicapped 18-year-old as an adult? Mm. And then it just got really deep into the weeds of that. So where they're clearly trying to go. She she really fucking ran house in that bar fight though. <laughs> I know. I guess mentally I, I shouldn't say mentally handicapped cuz I mean she's her it's not like she's she's not mentally handicapped. She's just, you know, more animalistic. So maybe that maybe that's did Maybe you ever they're see, equating that. I don't know. Did but. you ever see that documentary about the girl who was locked in her room from basically birth until she was like 12 or something like that? She was like strapped to a chair by her parents. No, no. Um, it's famous. She And she came out very much like a feral child when people mm. rescued her from that situation. Mm -hmm. But you run into the the conundrum of you don't know whether or not the abuse caused the mental handicap or if it was sure. something that was sort of there from birth. Uh, and that's the way that the parents reacted to it. Sure. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very similar to this, except that's more, that's the tragedy of the documentary is that you can't fix the girl. So she, she sort of has right. this life where she can never fit into modern society. And they, they show all the ways that like, this is uh, damaging to her and like her, her happiness comes from just sort of being this like feral child uh, outside Mm -hmm. They can't do that with Molly because they have to fix her, and that's the problem with it. And I don't yeah, even know luckily, if that's the right way to go, go with the episode, but it's what it reminds me of. Luckily, in this episode, you can just throw her in the trash, and she comes out perfectly formed. Yep, throw her in the big glowing purple ball. Uh, Zam Nuclear Wessel says, It's a consequence-free, cheap play for sympathy, but on that level, it works for me. Perhaps the ultimate insult is that it feels like an above-average episode of Voyager. That has the same time travel mechanic as City on the Edge of Forever. So eat it's it, very similar, everyone. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Matt Ross says, so you just leave a time portal unguarded. Sure, why not? I mean, I know it's the high-tech 24th century, but how about a sign? I think O'Brien would have reached out to grab Molly a little better. As for 18-year-old Molly, then we come to the argument of children of time that the damaged, hurt individual would have gone if they did a time travel switch. I'll take it. Shut up, doctor. Then it's time to fake then it's time for fake parental humor for a baby Yoshi. As to Molly, let's be honest, does anyone think 10-year-old Molly of replicator culture would be able to survive eight years on a wild, untamed planet? It was no, handy she would have died of, like, Bajoran cholera in, like, a, a day and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I actually thought they were on Bajor. I guess they're not. They're on some other planet. But uh, it was handy to have that tree and grass set up on the station, too. Not only did O'Brien suffer, I think we all did on this pondering episode. That was a favorite thing of mine where Cisco was like, let her live in the cargo bay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know. I I like that building a fake forest in the cargo bay was the first answer and not like, hey, Quark, uh, we are uh, recommending this hollow yeah. deck. Yeah, commandeering this hollow deck for uh, the foreseeable future. <laughs> and, what, what, and what sort of torture were those Klingons uh, doing to Quark while they were trying to get that hollow suite away from O'Brien? He's like, he needs to use it now. They want to kill people <laughs> now. <laughs> Dwayne Hackett says, You didn't think we would end the season without another O'Brien Must Suffer episode, said one writer to the next in a pitch meeting. O'Brien being forced to come to terms with potentially losing his firstborn is perhaps the absolute worst thing that he has been put through thus far. Although touching on first watch when it aired, this is a massive skip for me. The supporting character that is the O'Brien family have not shown much proper development as actual human beings, which, come to think of it, may be another way for him to suffer. I will give Hannah uh, Hattay for being a child. I forgive her for being a child actress, but Michelle Krusiak and Rosalind Chow, no, just no. Though th uh, throughout the years, I come to realize that as a Trek actress, Chow is as bland as they come. This episode did not help me change my mind. Her best episodes being the time where she was actively working against Calmini in episodes like The Assignment in Whispers. Clear filler of an episode, someone needed to have been reprimanded for putting the actress through it. This is an episode you watch once, if that, and never again. Are zeros allowed? One out of five. Uh, Will Yates. Man, Miles does not like his family. Molly's okay with that planet at 18. <laughs> but what about when she's 36 and breaks her ankle? And, that's, and the first thing he says to his wife after Molly falls is leave. I wonder what Odo was thinking when Kira said she wanted to have a baby. If you have kids, you can understand Worf. And then, Neil Brennan, final comment. A zero out of five for this awful season one level stinker. A six out of five for Miles O'Brien saying bollocks. It's true. He does. He, he curses in this episode. He's under yeah, a lot of stress. I love that American television lets you get away with uh, European curse words. Yes. Yep. And apparently they let you put them as the title of your book and nobody cares. That's right. 
That's right. Or the yeah, title of your uh, album cover and everything like that. All right. So that's it. Thank you, patrons, for leaving your thoughts. Not a lot of thoughts about Time's Orphan. We didn't have a lot of thoughts about Time's Orphan. Clay, what are you going to give this one? Yeah, that's a one. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, just out of the redemption of the Wharf storyline, I'm going to give it a week two, I think. That's fair. Um, I did like that. The Molly stuff is a one level, I'd agree. But I, I did like the Wharf stuff for what it's worth. Uh, it's only about 10% of the episode, but what are you going to do? Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you very much for listening to Time's Orphan. Clay, what do you think about this stretch of season six where it's gone kind of into the uh, the tube, gone down the tubes a little bit? Yeah, it's gotten pretty rough. Um, does this season have the highest highs and the lowest lows that we've seen yet? Probably. I, um, yeah. I don't know. I, I yeah, I don't know if I would say lowest lows. It's certainly the biggest uh, uh, discrepancy between those I two. I guess that's what I mean. Is it have the biggest swing? Yes, I think so yeah. by far. Um, I mean, for ones we had resurrection, we've had this one profit and lace. It's pretty, pretty egregious. So th- that's a good discussion for, uh, we're coming to the end now of season six, right? And, uh, I keep these episode scores and I rank them and people have come into season six saying season six is the best season of star Trek, uh, or of, uh, DS nine. And hmm. I-, I wonder if season four, uh, is my favorite season four looks like it's going to come out with a higher, like av- like numerical average for whatever that's worth. But would you yeah. would you rather have a season that has higher highs and a lot of lows, or would you have a consistent, very strong, but not great for twenty six mm. episodes? That's tough. Um, I think the consistent not have we season four did not get a one from either of us the entire yeah. way through. I th- I think as a writing accomplishment across 26 episodes, that's a much harder accomplishment than what season six did. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Because um, I think having <laughs> – that's why you always aim for the middle, kids. Um, I think having episodes that are so good in uh, paired with episodes that are so bad – really makes you uh i think it makes the 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 bad ones even worse mm. when you see how so good close they to could each other be. yeah right yeah um <clears throat> so i can see why yeah d- why being consistent i mean consistency is always what you want anyway but uh um yeah i would say it's probably as long as it's not boring you know if it's if if they're consistently like mid level 3s then nah, i don't really want that right um, but if they were consistently solid to really good, then yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so a season of fours over seasons of fives and ones kind of. Yeah. I think I would, I think I would take that. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, the, the one confounding aspect would be if, uh, like I, I posed this when Bill came on and we talked about, it. I have like, if you had like a, a desert Island choice where you were allowed one season from each series. I think in that case, I would take season six because yeah. it feels more DS9 y to me. So that's mm-hmm. the difference. Not that it matters. People are free to uh, obviously like what they like. But season six is interesting for the highs and the lows are sharply in contrast with each other. Mm. Guys, yeah, thank definitely. you very much for listening. All the links are down below. Patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show. Facebook, Twitter, join the Discord channel. You can chat with everybody, talk about these episodes, talk about everything, talk about memes meme culture and then uh i think that, i think that's it anything else rate us on uh itunes all the stores stuff if you're on reddit and someone asks for a star trek podcast we'd recommend a recommendation for ourselves thank you very much clay do you have anything you want to say uh no i'm actually i'm out of things to plug at the moment actually mm. um yeah listen to badass i guess Listen to Badass. We have a new Real Ripe coming out. We have started uh, Catherine Bigelow, so we did Hurt Locker, and that'll come out next mm-hmm. week, I believe, if this timing is right. So it'll come out on a Wednesday or something or Tuesday. Uh, and we're going to do Hurt Locker, Weight of Water, and then what's that vampire one called? Near Dark. Near Dark. Those are the three for that. So you can look forward to that. And I think that's pretty much it. Thank you guys very much for watch- uh, listening, and we hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back with the penultimate episode. Is it the penultimate episode? It is, right? We've got two left in the season. Two left in the season, Clay, really? and then we're on to the final season. So it's the sound of her voice is the next one. How many episodes are in this season? 26. This is episode oh, 24. Really? Yep. Oh, for some reason, I, oh, I'm getting, 
I'm getting my numbers mixed up with with where I am in Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I was watching Cheers last night, and I was like, "Wow, I'm I'm 16 episodes into season eight, and then so 16 was on my mind, and I didn't look at the number for this one, so I assumed it was the same. Two left. Uh, the sound of a voice yeah. is next. Also, if you really want to, if you really want to be disturbed, extrapolate how much time it's taken me to get to s- episode 16 of season season eight of Cheers, uh, based on the first time I ever watched Cheers, which was when we covered it for the Patreon podcast. So uh you've been you've been churning you through the, the show. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 the first show I've ever encountered where I it has become like a comfort show immediately. Mm. Like I sit I sitting down and watching two episodes of Cheers is like the most relaxing, comforting thing I can do with my day these right. days. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's, I never had any attachment to it before. And then it was just, it, it hooked me so good, so well off the first episode that it's just, you know, I've been so interested to see where, you know, what the, what happens with the characters and cause everybody on it is so good. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. I was not expecting to be, uh, this into it so quickly. How many seasons are there? 10, 11, 11. Okay. Yeah. So you're almost you're almost at the finish line with that. Which which is going to finish first? Cheers or Star Trek DS Nine? Ooh, um, pro- honestly, possibly Cheers. Uh, I don't know. I guess it depends on on whether or not I slow down on it. Well, since we have other stuff to watch, the thing is, it's become like a a nighttime show for my girlfriend and I to watch because she doesn't like watching intense stuff before she goes to bed, <laughs> which is un- understandable. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, it's only a half an hour. Um, but now that, uh, glow is back, uh, the good place just came up. The new season of the good place just came up on, on, on Netflix. And there's like a couple other things that are shorter shows that, uh, um, that can, might be able to fill that gap. We might end up watching it a little bit slower than we have been. Yeah. A lot of competition for your attention. And that's why we're so happy that you guys are listening to us. So with that, we will wrap it up. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time with the sound of her voice. 